Hi folks and welcome to our second installment on Christian Metz's film Semiotics. This time we're going to start with this basic question. What would a Metzian semiotic analysis look like? And just a bit of a recap, the main points of this book Film Language, A Semiotics of the Cinema, is this. The central question is, is film a language? Christian Metz's answer, in the most simplest terms possible, is yes and no. What he means by that is that film is a language, but not a language system. It's not a language system because shots aren't words. Now, all the reasons that shots don't count or are not analogous to words are given in the previous video. The idea here is that words are a very special kind of sign. And words work to produce meaning by virtue of differing from each other within a larger system. That's what it means to understand language as a language system through the discourse known as structural linguistics. Christian Metz's point is that no matter how much film language seems to resemble spoken language, it's just not because individual components of film that we might call shots do not function in that very abstract way in the way that words function. But what about the positive argument? Christian Metz says that film is not a language system, but he does insist that film is still a language or langage, to borrow the terms of Ferdinand de Saussure. So let's go back to those two shots that we looked at earlier. And we said that, well, at the very least, we know that these two shots or any shot in film is not equivalent to a word that might seem to substitute for it. That shot does not mean gun and that face does not mean face. But why can't these shots mean something as simple as gun or face? Well, one major reason is that shots always come after particular shots and they come before particular shots. In other words, they are embedded in a sequence of images. So Christian Metz is going to say that film is indeed like a language because editing forms signification along a syntagmatic chain. And if you actually read the book Film Language, you're going to see this word syntam and syntagmatic all throughout the entire book. Now, he's not going to explain it to you because he's going to presume that you understand that word because he's going to presume that his audience is familiar with the structural linguistics of Ferdinand de Saussure, but I'm not going to do that. And so let me explain what that word syntagmatic means since it's so crucial to this entire book. Okay, so syntagmatic is an adjective that's drawn from the book Course in General Linguistics by Saussure, and it means this of or denoting the relationship between two or more linguistic units used sequentially to make well-formed structures. Now, I know that seems abstract right now. The first thing that we want to do is contrast syntagmatic to its opposite, paradigmatic, which means of or denoting the relationship between a set of linguistic items that form mutually exclusive choices in particular syntactic roles. Now, let me explain this a bit further. Imagine that you have a sentence. Syntagmatic relationships are the actual relations between the words in the sentence. But paradigmatic relationships are the potential relations between the words that could be used in that sentence. Let's illustrate with a finer example. Imagine you have this sentence, the cat sat on the mat. The entire sentence, the cat sat on the mat, can be called a syntagmatic chain. The words relate syntagmatically to each other. For example, when you start a sentence with the word the, you are already presupposing the kind of word that can follow the. Only a noun is going to follow the word the. You would not have a verb follow the because that just doesn't make sense within the possible rules of understanding English. In the same way, when you have a noun like cat, you're not going to follow it with a word like the. You're likely going to follow it with a noun so you know what the cat is doing. So the relationship between cat and sat forms a particular, very precise syntagmatic relationship. But paradigmatic relationships are different. Notice that we're writing paradigm vertically. That's because paradigmatic relationships name the kinds of words that can be swapped in any given place. For example, the first iteration of the sentence is the cat sat on the mat. But cat and dog share a particular paradigmatic relationship such that I can substitute cat for dog and still have a similarly structured sentence that means a very similar kind of thing. In the same way, I can swap dog for baby and have a similar sentence because dog and baby form a paradigmatic relationship. Now we have to be precise here because you might say that, oh, you mean any particular noun, but no. 
Not any noun is going to fit there because if I put fish there, the fish set on the mat doesn't make sense because fish does not syntagmatically take the verb and preposition sat on. Fish just don't sit. And so the words baby and dog and cat form a paradigmatic category structure. To give you another example of how to think about this, take a sentence like John ate an octopus. If you change the syntagmatic relationships in this sentence, you'll change the meaning. So for example, John ate an octopus becomes an octopus ate John. It's the same exact words, but we've changed the syntagmatic relations and now we have a completely new meaning. But now what happens if I change the paradigmatic relations? Well, now I have an elephant ate John, which indeed changes the meaning of the sentence, but in a pretty different way. And if I continue to change the paradigmatic relations, notice the similar kind of meaning given. Something is eating John. It's important to note that syntagmatic and paradigmatic relationships also dictate the formation of words. So when you have a sequence of letters like C-L-A-Y making the word clay, those letters relate syntagmatically such that I can replace C with P and create a sound that signifies something that's intelligible in English, from clay to play. But I can't replace that P with a T because we just don't have that sound T-L-A-Y or any T-L sound in English. Now, one of the main grand arguments that Saussure is trying to make by thinking about language this way is this. Concepts are purely differential and defined not by their positive content, but negatively by the relations with other terms in the system. So this idea about language that Saussure is trying to argue is revolutionary, partly because he's not saying that language is this thing where sounds that come out of our mouths correspond with things in the world. Like the word ball corresponds with that thing ball that's resting in the corner of a bedroom. Rather, what he's trying to say is that words signify things to us by virtue of negating everything that they're not. This is what it means to say that language is a static, self-contained system. Now, Christian Metz is going to say that this is indeed Saussure's main point about what makes language a language system. And I don't think that film operates in this way. However, I still think signification in film operates syntagmatically. And you can see him say this here. Christian Metz says, but more than paradigmatic studies, it is the syntagmatic considerations that are at the center of the problems of filmic denotation. Although each image is a free creation, the arrangement of these images into an intelligible sequence, cutting and montage, brings us to the heart of the semiological dimension of film. It is a rather paradoxical situation. Those proliferating and not very discrete units, the images, when it's a matter of composing a film, suddenly accept with reasonably good grace the constraint of a few large syntagmatic structures. So basically what Metz is saying here is this. He's saying, although I've spent this entire chapter of my book trying to convince you that film is not a system, the way that language is a system, because the images located in film are not these abstract entities. Still, if you look at film writ large, what you see are these almost pseudo-grammatical patterns that create meaning. He's calling those patterns syntagmatic structures. So now I want to look at an example of a syntagmatic structure, in other words, a film sequence, and think about it the way that Christian Metz would think about it. This is the opening of Strangers on a Train by Alfred Hitchcock. So the film Strangers on a Train is a 1950 thriller directed by Alfred Hitchcock. It's about two strangers who meet on a train, a young tennis player named Guy and a wealthy and charming sociopath named Bruno. After learning about Guy's difficulty in trying to divorce his wife, Bruno proposes, hypothetically, that he murder Guy's wife in exchange for Guy murdering Bruno's father, who he also wants dead. The idea being that each will murder a total stranger with no apparent motive, thereby being the perfect murder. So that's the basic premise of the film, but I want you to pay attention to this opening sequence of the film in which we are introduced to our two main characters simply as alternating shots of feet walking through the train station. The main question I want you to think about is, what do you know about the spatial and temporal relationship between these two pairs of feet? And how do you know those things? In other words, considering that these are simple shots which contain little information by themselves, they are, after all, mostly shots of feet walking, how is it that they come to signify such precise information about their placement in space and time? 
This is a question that is strictly in the realm of what Christian Metz will call denotation, as opposed to connotation. Denotation means the most immediate storytelling information that's given through precise choices in editing. Excuse me. Now, if Christian Metz would watch this sequence, the first thing that he would say is that he would identify one of the main syntagmatic categories that he's constructed in his book. So you'll see in this book film language this large diagram in which he's going to identify and name particular kinds of syntagmas. And what he means by syntagma is simply a sequence that has a particular logical structure. And I think he would pretty easily and immediately categorize the opening of Strangers on a Train as what he calls an alternate syntagma, which is more widely known as cross-cutting or parallel montage. And he defines alternate syntagma this way. He says the alternate syntagma is well known by theoreticians of the cinema under the names alternate montage, parallel montage, synchronism, etc. Typical example, shot of the pursuers followed by a shot of the pursued and back to a shot of the pursuers. Definition, the montage presents alternately two or more series of events in such a way that within each series, the temporal relationships are consecutive, but that between the series taken as wholes, the temporal relationship is one of simultaneity. In other words, the alternate syntagma or parallel montage or cross-cutting is defined by the impression of simultaneity, that these two feet are indeed happening in succession, but we get the impression that they're walking simultaneously, and that impression comes from a kind of pattern that signifies a rather complex temporal phenomenon. But I don't just want to do that with this sequence. I don't just want to look at this sequence and say, oh, this is an example of cross-cutting, which is one of the major syntagmatic categories. No, I want to look at it more abstractly and ask the kinds of questions that Metz is asking about cinema in general. In other words, I want us to look at this little sequence and ask the big questions. How can these simple images signify so much? For instance, how can this particular image, which is only a shot of feet walking screen left, mean so much? This image denotes a lot more than merely, here are some feet. But how? Well, the answer is that it gains significance by virtue of what comes before and after it. It gains significance by being located within a syntagmatic chain. And I want to look at this particular sequence and marvel at the fact that it conveys so much information, but gives us so little. So what I want to do is analogize these six shots, each giving us a pair of feet, to this famous sentence. So for linguists, this has been a popular example of the way that language can take one word and using syntactical structure actually create meaning out of something that seems meaningless. So this is a sentence in English that simply repeats the word buffalo eight times. But the magic of the sentence is that it actually makes sense. It, it conveys a sensical piece of information and it adheres to the grammatical principles of English language. But at first, it's going to look and sound like meaningless garble. And if I isolate one particular iteration of the word buffalo, analogous to isolating one particular image of feet, it's going to not seem like it takes place within a syntagmatic chain. But now I want to teach you to understand the sentence. So how am I going to do that? Well, first, I'm going to give you a clue that in the English language, the word buffalo can mean three different things. Buffalo is the name of a city. It's the name of a noun, a synonym for American bison. And it's a verb. To buffalo means to intimidate. And now I'm going to read the sentence in a way that carries the inflection of these three types of words, the adjective form, the noun form, and the verb form. Buffalo, 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 buffalo. I'm going to translate the sentence to make it a bit easier. Those buffaloes from buffalo that are intimidated by buffaloes from buffalo intimidate buffalo from buffalo. The idea here is that syntax and grammar are creating meaning from the meaningless. And that as those syntagmatic relationships start to form in your mind, I hope you'll start to see that there is signification, even though it's a kind of ridiculous signification, within this sentence, which still contains nothing but the same word buffalo repeated eight times. And now I want you to look at this sequence again and think about how meaningless an alternation between two different pairs of feet should feel. But when you watched the film, it didn't seem meaningless. In fact, you understood without thinking about it so many kinds of signification. For example, you understood, number one, that these two people walking were walking simultaneously. Number two, you also understood that they were walking toward each other. 
Nothing guarantees the fact that they were walking toward each other, but simply filming them walking toward two different screen directions, one walking screen right and one walking screen left, produced the impression that they were walking toward each other. And you might even understand a third basic point, that you wouldn't understand these temporal and spatial relationships unless the two pairs of feet were shown exactly the way that they're shown and that the two pairs of feet are markedly different. They belong to two different people. And we know that because we recognize a different pair of pants and importantly, a different pair of shoes. You could even add connotative meanings to these denotative meanings. For instance, it's hard not to make a lot of the fact that one of those pairs of shoes is shiny and flashy and the other is ordinary, perhaps signifying a difference in wealth and maybe a difference in personality or temperament. If you want to jump even further into connotation, you might say that introducing our two characters in this particular way reinforces this motif of the crisscross. Each fellow does the other fellow's murder, then there's nothing to connect them. Each one has murdered a total stranger. For example, your wife, my father, crisscross. Which you can see visually throughout the opening sequence. From crossed legs, to the crossing of train tracks, to the crisscross pattern on our protagonist's tie, to the crisscross that we see in the train crossing sign, and that we might even say, as some have said before, that the visual diagram that would represent a cross can also help visualize the basic narrative structure of the film, in which Bruno proposes a murder plot, in which Guy kills his father in exchange for Bruno killing Guy's wife. Each one has somebody that he'd like to get rid of. So, they swap murders. So what you have here is a layer of different kinds of signification that emerge from the idea of film as a syntagmatic chain, where each image signifies a lot more than the simplicity of what it shows us by virtue of being placed in a system, sometimes a system of alternating contrasts and sometimes a system of motifs or repeating images that might connect to a plot. Christian Metz was more interested in the denotative side than the connotative side. But I wanted to simply show you how one sequence always has both sides ha happening simultaneously. Okay, I hope that clears up Christian Metz's film Semiotics, and I'll see you next time.